But we're posting the med grades tonight. Yeah, so I'm I'm just about seventy five percent done with the grade, okay. so I'm just I'm just going to power through tonight. And then mm -hmm. post. I'm I'm not able to return the exams just because there's there's one student who's kind of in a position where he hasn't taken the exam yet. Okay, yeah. Um, so I won't be able to return the exams until after he's taken it, but I'll at least post the scores. So, so. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm just mean so great in the test. Yes. Yeah. So I'm uh yeah, I just told someone I'm about 75% done. So tonight I'm just gonna power through it. Just go for it. Thank you. I won't be able to return the exams um mm -hmm. for a little bit just because uh, one student hasn't taken it yet. It's kind of in a unique position where yeah, right now. I heard so there's black is uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's that too much. Got it. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's very personal. Um but I'll be able to post the scores in this event. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, four o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Good, doing good. Okay. Um, so just uh, just an announcement. So uh, so I'm I'm just about maybe seventy five percent done grading all the uh, midterm exams, uh, and so uh, tonight I'm just planning on just just powering through, just finishing it. And so uh, before you go to sleep tonight, if you check Canvas, you you should see your score there. 
Um, so, so far, the, the scores are really good. So I think uh, for the most part, I think the uh, uh, the exams are uh, going to be, the average should be probably in the 80s, so 80%, so that's uh, really good. Um, and so, uh, so um, I was also mentioning before the class that I won't be able to return the exams, uh, just because there's kind of a unique circumstance right now. Um, and so uh, I won't be able to return the exams, you know, for a little bit of time, but you'll at least know your score. And so uh, the score we posted uh, tonight, okay? Um, and then once once that kind of situation is resolved, then, then I'll be able to return the exam Okay. Okay. Um, so look forward to that tonight. Okay. Um, all right. And so the plan for today is uh, we're just going to continue on with our lecture notes. And so we were uh, discussing gait biomechanics. Uh, so the biomechanics of walking. And remember, this is kind of our entryway into human dynamics. Okay. So we're going to talk a bit more about today about, uh, about reaction forces, about biomechanical modeling, um, you know, kinematics, um, dynamics, all, all of those things, kind of all within the context of. of okay. All right. Um, any questions uh, that I can answer before we uh, get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. And so uh, let me actually start by just scrolling up here a little bit. Okay. Um, and so when we left on uh, on Monday, we were talking about this idea of the ground reaction forces. Okay, um, and so you know when we're talking about gate biomechanics, uh, and you know that you know you can you can call it locomotion too. I, I think I've called that a couple of times in this in the class. Um, you're you're talking about kind of moving your the human body from one place to another. Okay, um, and so your your body actually isn't able to do that on its own. Uh, because any muscle, remember, any force that your muscle generates are considered to be internal forces to your body. Um, and it's physically impossible for any kind of internal forces to produce external movement of the, of the center of mass. Right? And so the way, the way that your body moves itself forward is to actually uh, rely mostly on the ground. And so, uh, and so when, you, when you drive your muscle forces into the ground, you, you, you basically uh, you know, exert force into the ground. Newton's third law basically said that the ground is going to input a, uh, a, an equal and opposite force um, to your body, right? And so that force is, is, is counts as an external force, and that's what propels your, your body forward, okay? So let's go ahead and, and draw a diagram of that, or just a very simple diagram, okay? Because when we think of kind of a ground reaction forces, you know, I, I think what a lot of people experience in their previous classes is a purely vertical force, right? And so you have an object that's sitting on the ground, like a chair or a table, right? Um, you have its force of gravity that's pushing it down, and then the normal force from the ground is, is, is opposing that force um, going that way. Okay, so the normal force, I think what most people are accustomed to is purely uh, vertical, or at least purely perpendicular to the ground. Okay? When you're walking, um, you know, of course, in order, for, in order to kind of move your, your, your body forward, there has to be some horizontal component to that normal force as, as well, okay? And so if I were to draw kind of a, a typical foot, so let's say that we have a foot that looks like this, okay? And so this is uh, one part of the of the gait cycle. So let's say this is this is kind of near near the end of the stance phase. So right when the toe is about to about to come off, okay? And so if you were to draw the the normal vector from the ground. It would actually look something like this. So it would have some kind of forward component. Okay. And if you think about kind of that phase of, of the walking cycle, right? And so if you're kind of walking and you're just about to lift your foot up, what you kind of can, you can kind of feel it in your own uh, foot too, right? Your foot is kind of like pushing backwards. And then the ground is kind of pushing you forward, right? And so the muscle force, or at least the, the torque that your muscle is generating, is going into the ground like this. Okay. And so the combination of your calf muscle and your uh, and your ankle joint and your toes produces a force that way into the ground, and the ground pushes you upwards. Like that. And so if we were to draw, if you, if we were to write out the equations of motion. And so recall that the equations of motions states that the sum of the forces vector is equal to mass times the acceleration. Okay. And so if we were if we were to count the entire body as, as one body, right? So this would be the mass of the whole body. 
and this would be the acceleration of the whole body. Acceleration twice. The acceleration of the body, not acceleration, acceleration. That's great. My mind is thinking five seconds ahead of uh, my mouth and my hand. Okay. And so we're going to sum up all of the external forces acting on the body. So the external forces, we, we generally have two uh, when we're walking. So we have um, the normal, we have the normal force, right? And so we have the normal force on the ground. Minus gravity. And so gravity is, is also acts as kind of an external force in the body. So we have minus M and D. So M body A. All right, so very, a very, very basic application of, of Newton's second law, right? And so we just have force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, so this, so this is the kind of the central equation. And so you know, in order to kind of move your your body forward, um, there have to be some kind of normal, right? Because what do we know about the gravity force? We know that gravity force by itself is always in the vertical direction, right? So gravity always kind of pulls us down, and so the only force that has any kind of horizontal component is this. So from a purely mechanics point of view, you know, all of this, this kind of makes sense. And so the, uh, whenever you're, you're measuring, um, you know, uh, um, you know, gate biomechanics, it's very often to use a tool called a force plate. So a force plate, if, if you haven't heard of it before, is, is you can think of it almost like a very fancy scale. Um, so a scale, you know, probably probably you know everyone has one in the past. And so you know, you you stand on it and it measures your, your weight, right? And so a force plate essentially does the same thing, but it can also pick apart the different components of the force. Okay. And so you're able to measure things like what's the vertical component of the um, vertical component of the ground reactive force and the horizontal component. So for those of you who are interested in, in sports science, I know there's a, there's a few people that kind of mentioned that to me uh, earlier this semester. You know, a force plate is a very, you know, it's very, very common in like a sports science lab as they kind of measure kind of, uh, you know, optimal performance. Okay. All right. And so, um, and so using a force plate, we're able to get some data on, um, on the ground reaction forces. Okay. And so let's, let's, let's find that. I'm going to draw kind of a typical a typical graph here. You know, of course, every everyone's um, you know walking gait cycle is different, and so everyone's going to produce a slightly looking graph. But I at least want to kind of point out kind of the uh, the distinguishing features of what you can expect to see. Okay, we have kind of a two axis graph here, and so the horizontal axis is time. And we're basically measuring the force that the force plate is is uh, is measuring as a function of time. Okay, and on the vertical axis we have force. 
more specifically the ground reactions. Okay. Let me draw a dotted line here. And so this dotted line is zero. So I'm, I'm offsetting it off the horizontal axis here, just, just to kind of make it a little bit easier to see. Okay. And we can draw two, uh, two curves here. And so the first curve is, is going to look something like this. And so in green right here, what I have is the vertical, uh, vertical component of the ground reaction force. And then let me use orange. Okay. And then in orange right here, I'm going to draw the horizontal component. So the horizontal component actually dips below zero. And so it actually comes down kind of like this. And then it comes up right here. And then it comes down like that. So orange here has the horizontal. All right. And so, of course, you can, you know, one, one thing you'll notice here is that the both the beginning and end of this graph is uh, it's at zero, right? So that's for the, both the vertical and uh, horizontal components, okay? And so we look at kind of the beginning of the graph, the end of the graph, they all kind of start and end at zero. The reason for that is we're only able to measure ground reaction forces when the foot is on the ground, right? So this is purely just for the stance phase. And so when your leg is in the swing phase, you know, your foot is off the ground. And so we don't, we can't measure any ground reaction forces. Okay. Um, you can do it for the other leg, but this, but this graph here is just for, it's just for one. Okay, um, so let's so let's look at the features of this graph because there, there's kind of a lot to unpack. Here, right? First thing I think first thing you'll notice here is that you know we we obviously have a negative component of the horizontal um, force. And so the negative direction here is actually pointing backwards, right? And so if, if we're assuming that a person's walking forwards, walking one direction, okay? A negative force would be a force in the going behind him, right? And so first, you know, that, that seems kind, kind of counterintuitive, right? And so if we're walking forward, you know, why do we have a force that's going backwards? Well, the reason for that is because, you know, when, when your toe kind of first touches down during the, the walking cycle, right? So this first component here, this is when the toe initially touches down. If you think about it, you know, when you're when you're kind of walking at a at a comfortable pace, right when your toe touches the ground, you know, it actually kind of acts as like a brake a little bit to kind of you know slow your momentum down. Because when you're walking, you know, you're not constantly accelerating, right? So you're walking at an even pace. And so your velocity is going to be even. There's, there's going to be a part during the walking cycle where you're going to be accelerating, okay? So, so when you have a positive uh, horizontal force, this is when you are accelerating. Okay. So that's essentially when you're pushing off the ground to just take a step. Okay? But in the first part of the gait cycle, um, in the first part of the stance, you know, you're actually slowing down. So that's what that negative component um, indicates. And so your body kind of does this primarily, you know, primarily to maintain speed uh, and also kind of to maintain balance too. So you're not kind of, you don't just kind of keep accelerating, you kind of just fall head over, you know, head over your heels. Okay. Okay. And the accelerating part, this is when you're pushing off the
ठीक है And so what's interesting about the horizontal component is that if you integrate that curve, okay, and so if you if you take basically the area under this curve right here, because you're walking at an even speed, you know, even though there's 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 parts of the gate cycle where you're 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 accelerating, you're decelerating, but in the overall sense over one cycle, your body has no acceleration, right? And so it's walking at a constant speed. So when you integrate this. It actually integrates out to zero. So that's so that's everything about the horizontal component, right? So you initially you're you're kind of breaking, you're slowing down when your foot your foot touches down, and then you accelerate when you you push off. Any questions on on this so far? Okay. All right. Let's look at the vertical component. All right. So the vertical component. Um, obviously does not uh, integrate to zero, nor does it go negative. The, the, forward, the vertical component is always positive. That's because the vertical component of the reaction force is supporting the weight of your body. Another way that you can think about it is that it counteracts the force of gravity. And so that's why that's why you know it's 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 always above zero. Okay. And so the other thing you'll notice is that the the, the vertical component has this kind of double peak behavior, right? So we have kind of an early peak and a, a late peak, right? And so the early peak here, this corresponds with the uh um, kind of the toe down event, right? And so when you initially kind of step down. Then um, you know that you have kind of uh, you're 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 kind of uh, lessening that impact of your foot coming down, and so that's why we have a, a peak there. Whereas the second peak, you know, that's during the push off phase, and so when you put it off the ground, you know, you're driving more force into the ground, and so that's going to cause a spike in the vertical reaction forces. So that's kind of a, a pretty um, you know, defining characteristic of the vertical. Okay. All right. I think that's all there is to say about the vertical. Yeah, not, there's not, not too much interesting about the vertical. Part. But one, well, one thing that is actually interesting, and uh, you, can, you can actually observe this too when someone's walking, is that you know because the vertical component is not even right, and so we have kind of a, a dip there, right? But throughout the entire gate cycle, and actually throughout as long as you're on Earth, it, it's always true. The gravity force is constant, right? And so the fact that you the fact that we have a varying um, you know vertical component here means that your center of gravity, in addition to moving forward, right, in addition to moving in a horizontal direction. It's actually going to have a little bit of vertical uh, vertical movement as well. Because if you were if you were to uh, measure uh, the gravity force, so you you were to take kind of the the weight uh, of the person or the mass of the person multiplied by gravity, you know it would probably be somewhere around here, you know, right in right in between those those peaks. Okay, and so when the when the vertical reaction force is greater than that, that means your center of mass is going to go up, and when it's uh, less than that, it's going to go down. Okay, 
And then that's true as, as you kind of switch from stance to uh, uh, to swing face as well. Okay. And that actually that actually that little bit of vertical movement is actually going to be very important uh, when we talk about the dynamics of, of walking as well in um, two minutes. All right, any questions on uh, on this? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the, the next part. So let's talk about walking, uh, walking dynamics and, and walking. So now that we have this data um, of the ground reaction forces, or at least the, the typical ground reaction forces for uh, someone walking, we can we can use this information to get the um, the acceleration, of course. So we just take the force divided by the mass of the person's body, and we can integrate it to get things like the velocity uh, and the position. And so remember our our uh, uh, our equation of motion here. Okay. So remember our equation of motion is um, mass times the acceleration. Okay. Question in the chat: uh, Wouldn't the value between the toe down push off correspond to a person's weight force due to gravity? Yeah, um, that's uh, um, that's that's what I'm saying. So the so the dotted line that I was drawing there was was kind of a constant gravity force. Uh, but the fact that you um, oh what you're saying is that the, the value here should be should be where the dotted line is. Yeah, so you are, you're absolutely correct. So when the, uh, um, yeah, when there's no kind of, um, oops. Uh, when there's no, when there's no uh, muscle force or no muscle um, activation, you know, the ground reaction force should exactly kind of support the, the body. So yeah, good, good observation. Thanks, thanks for catching. Yeah, basically what that uh, uh, what that comment was saying is that you know when when you're kind of in between these events of toe down and push off, your muscles are kind of mostly passive, and so when your muscles are passive, you know your your legs still have to support the weight of your body, um, and so the uh, um, the valley kind of the lowest point of the ground reaction force should exactly correspond to the weight of the body. So, um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. So thanks, uh, thanks for catching that. Okay. Um, right, so we have uh, some of the forces equal to mass times acceleration. So if we divide by the mass, then we get the acceleration, right? So we have acceleration is equal to some of the forces divided by mass. And of course, we can break this up because it's a vector uh, into its horizontal and vertical components. So we'll call the horizontal component AX and the vertical component A Y. Okay. All right. And of course we can integrate this. And so for instance, let's say we can compute the horizontal component of the velocity. Okay. So normally this is this is a quantity of interest because the horizontal component of the velocity is going to be your, your essentially your walking speed. Okay. And so to compute this, we can just take an integral of the horizontal component of the acceleration ax with respect to time. Okay, so we integrate a of x um, as a function of uh, dt. Okay. Where, a of, where ax here is a function of t because it is changing with time, so it's, it's not a constant. Okay. So that would be a function that we would have to integrate. Similarly, we can compute, you know, let's say the vertical composition of the, of the center of mass as a function of time as well. So this is y, this y right here is the vertical position.
of center of mass. Okay. And so if velocity is the first integral of acceleration, then position would be the second double integral. Okay. We would take two integrals of the vertical component of the acceleration, a y, where a y is a function of t, and we integrate it twice with respect to t. Okay. Okay. So v of x here, let me just make it clear, v of x and y are both functions of time. This is okay. okay. So all these integrals here, even though t is a dummy variable, you know, we're basically we're basically just performing the antiderivative. So we're basically integrating from zero to okay. So I, I chose I chose these two quantities on purpose because we can we can take these two quantities and compute um, you know two I think very important um, quantities of, of dynamics you've probably seen before. Okay. And so using the horizontal velocity, we can compute the kinetic energy. And so if you recall from your, your physics class or dynamics class, kinetic energy, I'll call it EK, is equal to one half times the mass uh, times the uh, horizontal velocity, function of time squared. And using the vertical position, we can compute a different kind of energy called the gravitational potential. Okay. All right, so the gravitational potential energy, I'll call it e, uh, EP, E for potential, is equal to the mass times gravity times the vertical position, Y of T. So you've probably seen that formula as MGH, where mass times gravity times height, uh, but height is and vertical position are the same. So it's going to be MG times. All right. So these two quantities are interesting because you know because the velocity or the instantaneous uh, horizontal velocity of the of the body changes with time. And the vertical position of the body change with time, then the amount of kinetic and potential energy that a person has also changes with time as a person walks. And in fact, if you if you actually measure it, and so if you take if you take the data that we had before and you integrate it and you compute these quantities, you will see that it has kind of a cyclic uh, pattern. In fact, they both they both kind of look like sine waves. Okay. And so there there are certain parts of the gate cycle where the kinetic energy is maximum, and certain parts of the gate cycle where the gravitational potential energy is at a maximum. And in particular, we're interested in kind of seeing when each of these are going to peak. And so let's talk about kinetic energy first, okay? And so kinetic energy experiences a peak uh, during the swing phase. Whereas potential energy, um, it has its peak in the middle of the stance phase. Okay. 
And so we can plot this. All right, so just like the last graph, I'm going to have the horizontal axis uh, correspond with time. And so this is going to show basically both the kinetic and the potential energy as a function of time throughout the gate cycle. Okay. The vertical axis will measure the amount of energy. Okay. So let's see what these uh, these look. Like. Uh, okay, we can use first. All right, so let's let's plot the, the kinetic energy first. And so if you plot the kinetic energy, you know it looks something like this. Okay. Well, here will be kinetic energy. And the fact that you see multiple peaks here, so this is this is across several gate cycles, and so it's the time the time scale is a little bit different from our first graph. And so the first graph was just kind of a single gate cycle. This is several gate cycles. Okay. Let me just go ahead and look at that. Several gate cycles. Okay. We have kind of multiple kind of touchdown events, multiple push off events, um, you know, multiple swing days, things like that. Okay, and then in yellow here, let's draw the potential energy. So if we draw the potential energy, it looks something like, is the yellow okay? Is that, uh, is that too hard to read? I, I usually don't use yellow, but that, I thought, you know, we're using purple, we might as well, you know, pull layers here and go purple. Okay. So what do we notice about this graph? Uh, besides, besides the colors, obviously. Right? So the, the, the thing that we should notice about this graph is that the two uh, energies are out of phase with each other. Okay? And so they're never peaking at the same time. In fact, you know, if you, if you plot this out, you know, the peak of one energy corresponds to the trough of the, of the other energy. In fact, if you if you sum these up, right, and so if you if you take these two energies and sum them up, what you'll see is that the amount of energy in the system or in the in the human body as it goes through the walking cycle is roughly constant. Okay? And so if you take their sum, you know, it might look something like this. Okay? And so in red here I have the total energy. So this is so this is fascinating because you know when we walk or you know as we walk you know kind of our general um, you know general impression or general feeling is that you know we're we're exerting a lot of energy to walk okay? so it takes us energy to walk in one place here but what this graph is basically telling us is that you know under you know and, the, and these supports are under ideal situations these are you know making a lot of assumptions but this tells us that walking is largely a passive um, exercise. Um, because, uh, you know, you're not, you know, you're adding energy to the system to counteract your weight, but in terms of the total energy, it's about cost. Okay? Um, and so walking, you know, at least of what we, when we look at it from an energetics point of view is, you know, nothing more than just a continuous exchange between kinetic and potential.
So that's why, you know, if you have to get from point A to point B um, and you want to conserve as much energy as possible, you know, the way that you do it is you, you walk. And, you know, intuitively, you know, that, that makes sense, right? So, um, you know, walking just saves a lot of energy. But the, the reason for that is because, you know, your, your body, aside from kind of supporting its own weight, supporting its own gravity, actually doesn't input that much energy when walking. It's just kind of taking the potential energy that you already had just, just from being off the ground and kind of converting that to, to kinetic energy uh, through the action of your limbs and, and the bending of your, of your, of your joints and things like that. So very, very fascinating, um, you know, um, kind of conclusion that we have here. Um, and it kind of, it, it leads to kind of a lot of interesting, um, you know, modeling and, and data as, as well. Any questions on, on this? Okay. I remember I, I told my wife about this. I said, you know, walking is, is mostly passive because you're just exchanging kinetic and potential energy. And she, she takes every opportunity to tease me about that because... Um, so she loves going to Disneyland. I don't like going to Disneyland because it's a lot of walking. And so there'll be times where like, I need to take a break. And she's like, come on, come on, honey. Your walking is, is passive. We can just, we can just walk in the woods here. I'm like, just give me a churro, just be quiet. And take a break right now, right? <laughs> but it's, 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 all, it's all fun. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about model, right? And so the, the fact that we, we have this kind of interesting result here means that we can kind of come up with some, um, some interesting ways to model walking in a laboratory or with other kind of equipment. Okay. In particular, there's there's one kind of very interesting model called the ballistic walking. So the ballistic walking model is, is what we describe as the biomechanical model for, for walking. Okay. And so throughout, throughout kind of the rest of the class here, I'm, I'm going to mention quite a few other models. And let me kind of describe what I, what I mean by that. Um, okay. And so when I, when I talk about a model, a model is nothing more than just kind of a representation of a physical quantity or physical phenomenon using kind of much simpler means or much simpler variables. So modeling is something that's just really, it's very common in general uh, when you're talking about kind of uh, engineering analysis or even sci or scientific analysis, because oftentimes, you know, a real kind of physical system has so many different elements and so much complexity that it's hard to kind of, um, you know, isolate this type of behavior that you want. Okay. And so for walking, you know, this is, or just, you know, just biomechanics in general, um, this is, this is almost always going to be the case. Um, because when you when you look at kind of the amount of complexity and the amount of degrees of freedom that's that's available for you know a typical human, it's oftentimes a little bit too overwhelming to kind of just to um, uh, study all at once. And so a lot of times, you know, when we want to you know when we want to isolate something like the walking gait, we develop a model so we can kind of you know study it in a lab and um, um, you know and, and kind of analyze it a lot more carefully. All right, and so let's and so if we look at kind of the the observation that we made about the the energetics of the walking cycle, you know, we can we can see that we have this kind of constant interchange or or, or interplay between kinetic and potential energy. And so this this should remind you of of something that you've you've 
probably seen before in a previous class, right? This looks very similar to a, a pendulum. And so if you, if you think about a pendulum, right? And so pendulum here, we have kind of a, um, you know, we have a weight that's hanging from the ceiling from a string, okay? What you can do is that you can kind of pull the pendulum this way, right? And so you kind of uh, um, pull it out. And when you release it, you know, the pendulum will kind of, you know, oscillate between its extremes, right? And so it's gonna kind of oscillate in kind of this pattern. If you look at the, the energetics of, of the pendulum, you'll see that's actually very similar to, to walking. Right? But this is a lot, this is a lot easier to analyze because it's it's geometrically, it's it's a lot, it's a lot simpler than a human body. Right? Because if we look at kind of the extremes of the pendulum, so if we look at kind of you know these parts here, when the pendulum reaches its maximum height, okay. And so at the ends of the path, we have a situation where the pendulum has essentially zero velocity, right? And so once, once it kind of reaches the extremes of the path, it kind of stays still for just a brief moment before coming down. And so at this time, the kinetic energy is at a minimum. Okay. Meanwhile, its gravitational potential energy is at a maximum. Because at the at the ends of the path there, that's the point on which it's kind of highest off the ground. Okay, so its height is the greatest there. The other extreme is when um, you know we reach kind of the the bottom part right here. Okay, and so in this bottom part right here, its height is at a minimum, and so when the height is at a minimum, its potential energy is also at a minimum. Meanwhile, its kinetic energy is at a maximum because when it's at kind of the, the lowest point there, that's when its speed is the greatest because it's, it's kind of just finished kind of accelerating from gravity and it's about to decelerate because it's about to kind of go up and back. Very similar to walking, except with a much, much simpler geometry. Okay. So this, so this is a great example here. And so, you know, oftentimes when, when you want to study something, um, you know, a, a particular motion or a particular part of the human body, a lot of times it's, it's really useful to kind of go through this exercise to see, you know, what are what are some similarities to something that I've I've seen in the real life, um, you know, and can we use that as a model for what we're studying, um, just to make it a lot easier for us to study. Okay. And so the pendulum. is a great model for walking. And so a long time ago, you know, bi biomechanical scientists kind of noticed this and, and started kind of playing with the pendulum and tried to see if they can improve upon that to get better modeling of the block. And so the pendulum is a, is a great start. So don't, don't get me wrong, right? But it doesn't look anything like walking. Right? So if you if you look at a pendulum, first of all, the pendulum's upside down, right? Um, and so if you uh, if you try to model that from walking, it's it'll be different. Right? And so you know this this model here kind of went through a series of improvements, okay? and so to kind of make things a little bit um, you know a little bit more realistic, 
we, they, scientists inverted the pendulum. And so we had uh, something that looked like this. We had kind of a, uh, a pin that stuck to the ground and we had a pendulum like, like this, okay? Of course, this is assuming that gravity is, is still kind of going this way, right? And so this is kind of, you're just kind of looking at a pendulum upside down. But what this does is, that, is this kind of gives you a bit more realistic um, kind of view because if you think of the pin here, this is like your foot. And the pendulum here, this is your uh, center of mass for the body. This starts to become a little bit more realistic, right? And so, you know, as you know, if you look at kind of one gait cycle where you put your foot on the ground and you kind of take a step, right? The the trajectory that the center of your mass of your body kind of takes a similar path as the as the pendulum, right? Um, of course, you know, the, with the pendulum, the, the foot here doesn't move, and so it's just going to kind of you know oscillate kind of back and forth. Here, okay. But at least for a single um, cycle or a single kind of step, you know, this is this is not a bad improvement of the uh, of the cycle. And eventually, you know, more things were added um, to the uh, to the to the cycle or to the uh, to the model. And eventually, we came up to this kind of ballistic walking model, uh, which is which is still actually quite simple. It's just a mechanism with with three bars and one pin joint. Okay. And so basically what scientists did was they took kind of that inverted pendulum, okay, where you have one foot on the ground and you have uh, something that comes up like that, okay? And so that, uh, this kind of long um, thing right here for this long um, string of the pendulum, this is gonna represent your stance, your stance leg during the game cycle. Okay, so that's meant to model your, your foot that's planted on the ground uh, during gait. Okay. And then to this, they attach two more linkages to model this the swing link. And so and so stemming from the same center of mass above, you know, we they basically uh, inserted two more linkages like this. And so these two linkages together, this is like your swing link. We have a very basic kind of three bar linkage, not exactly a three bar linkage, because if you just leave this on its own, it's just going to fall, it's going to fall down. Um, but, uh, you know, something, something quite simple here that's model. Okay. All right. And so the way, the way scientists kind of tested this model is they said that, okay, if, if this is going to be our model for walking, it should at least kind of realistically kind of simulate what it means. Okay. And so what scientists did was that they, they took this ballistic walking model and they kind of put it under different situations to see if it can kind of accurately simulate a single step. And so a single step was, was defined in a certain way. So if we if you kind of started like this, and so let's say you kind of start from a position where the stance leg is kind of angled to the, uh, you know, from our perspective to the left, okay? And let's say that this person is walking this way. And so kind of when the stance leg is kind of angled back, Okay, that's the beginning of the stance phase, okay? And then during the stance phase, you know, as you're trying to step down the foot, your center of mass is gonna travel this way. Okay? So it's, it's gonna kind of travel in that kind of part. And so during this, you know, you have your swing leg, right? Okay? And so after a lot of trial and error, what scientists have found is that even with this kind of very simple model, you know, if you put it under the right conditions, so you give, you give the center of mass the right velocity, you start everything in, in kind of a proper position that's, that's kind of realistic, you're able to kind of simulate the step. So you're able to kind of come over here where the stance like kind of uh, makes that kind of, uh, you know, basically a quarter turn. And the way scientists tested to see if this was uh, if this was right 
is that you know as as that as that um bot, as the center of mass kind of made that turn, the swing leg clears the ground. Okay. Because if, if you don't put it in the right position, as you kind of rotate right, rotate this over, the swing leg is going to kind of drop drop to the ground. It's kind of just it's just going to kind of hit the ground. It's not going to clear. But under the right conditions, you know, you can give the center of mass the right gravity, and you can do so to make the swing legs, um, you know, clear, clear the ground. So this looks great. So um, you know it doesn't it doesn't look that it doesn't look that impressive, but you know, and so from this model, you know, scientists were able to kind of discover quite a few things, right? Because from you know, from the data that we've found, right? So from the force plate, you know, we we basically kind of have this hypothesis that walking is mostly a passive, passive activity, right? Um, and so by passive meaning that you know you basically take potential energy and you convert it to kinetic energy. And so if we kind of follow that logic, if we make kind of a holistic walking model with purely kind of rigid component system, um, so you notice that there's no actuators on here, there's no, there's no motors, there's no engines, right? And so these are all just, these, these are literally just sticks, right? And so sticks aren't able to kind of actively produce force like a muscle, right? And so using kind of purely passive components like this, we were able to model kind of one important part of the walking gate set, okay? Of course, you know, aside from kind of the initial kind of the initial energy that you have to provide it, right? And so in order to get this to work, you have to provide kind of initial velocity. Okay. Aside from that, you know, you can you can take a step without you know exerting really any any energy. Okay? And and that's and that's consistent with what we found, right? And so there there is a, at least a minimum amount of energy that's within the system. So you need to have at least some energy to at least accelerate and start walking. But once you kind of get a good cadence going. You know, it's it's largely passive. So in that in those cases, your leg muscles aren't really doing that much, uh, aside from supporting your aside from supporting your weight, of course. Okay. Um, and then from there, it's just kind of you know just you're just kind of rolling along with the uh, kinetic potential kinetic potential. This was this was kind of a great breakthrough in kind of the studying of the walking humans. All right, any questions on on this? Okay, and so we can and so we can actually use this model for for other things as well because the uh, um, because the uh, uh, the pendulum has a lot of other properties that we can uh, we can exploit. Okay. So let me go ahead and draw the pendulum here. I'll draw it right side up just because that's the uh, that's what we typically you know has. So let's say that the string for the pendulum has a known length. So we'll say that length is L, and we'll say the mass at the end has the mass. Yes. All right. Let's do uh, let's do a force balance here, right? And so let's let's say that we are. Kind of in the middle of a swing motion, right? And so this this pendulum is swinging, and let's 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 draw all the forces acting on the uh, um, you know 
on the uh, um, on the uh, on the weight. Um, All right, and so we have some of the forces acting on, on the weight. Okay. And so what we have here is the uh, um, is gravity, mg, that's in the minus direction. We have the tension in the rope, T. And this is equal to its mass times acceleration. But let me but let me do something really um, kind of a little bit different. Right? And so because we have a pendulum motion here, the path that the pendulum is following is roughly circular, right? Or it is circular. So when we whenever we have circular motion right here, we have not just the standard acceleration, but we have its centripetal acceleration. So we have mass times the velocity squared. Divide by two. All right. And let me do this too. So uh, and so if we um, so I I, you know, I I kind of messed this up a little bit. So I apologize for this. So let's and so let's let's kind of ignore the tension for a second. Okay. And so let's consider just the gravity force. Uh, and in fact, let's make the gravity force positive. Okay. And so we're and so we're looking at just the uh, just the just the centripetal motion. And so we are ignoring. Okay, so we have this this relationship here of mass times gravity is equal to its centripetal centripetal um, force. Okay, and so let me go ahead and write that down here. So we have mass times gravity is equal to mass times the velocity squared divided by two. Okay. We can cancel out the, the mass on both sides of the equation here. I'm sorry, I messed this up royally. Okay. And so it's centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is not v squared divided by two, it's squared divided by the length. Sorry about that. Okay, now 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 it's working out. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, so let's solve for the velocity from this expression. Okay, so if we solve for velocity, I'm going to multiply both sides by the length, and so we have velocity is equal to square root of gravity times. The... Sorry about that. I made a ton of mistakes in that. Okay. So the re the reason I, I want to get this result here is that this this expression here is is an expression of the uh, velocity of the pendulum, right? But we've already discussed that the pendulum is is a great model for the walking gait. Okay. And so this velocity here, we can kind of interpret it as kind of a um, kind of a uh, uh, an expression of the of the walking. Speed, okay. But the velocity that we're looking at for the pendulum is the horizontal velocity, and so that's the horizontal velocity that we're looking at for the walking. Okay. And so what this expression tells us is that the walking speed depends on two things, right? And so it depends on gravity. You know, which in most cases we can't really do anything about, right? And so gravity is always going to be constant. 
But one thing that does vary a lot for people is the length. Okay. And if we're talking about, um, you know, talking about a person walking, this length here is the length of that person's leg. All right. So what this expression tells us is that you know if you have a longer leg or you have longer legs, you're a taller person, then you're going to have a, a faster walking speed than someone with shorter legs. Okay. So in, intuitively, we we know this to be true, right? And so we have kind of a very small person and a very tall person, right? We, we know it kind of takes the small person kind of multiple steps um, to kind of catch up to the tall person. You can even think of uh, uh you know I always think of um, the movie The Incredibles where like there's a tiny lady Edna Mode and she's like it's like kind of scurrying like that and then. You know, Mission Incredible is just taking a few steps. So, you know, intuitively, I think we kind of understand this, but you know, we, we, we basically kind of come to that same result using our pendulum model here. But the other interesting thing about this uh, equation here is that you know your walking speed does depend on on gravity, okay? And so most times, you know, gravity is, is nothing we can do about. Um, but you know, if you've ever seen videos of, of people walking on the moon, or seen kind of, I think movies do a pretty good job of this of, of you know, people walking in space. You know, people walk really slow on the moon, and that's not just a theatrical effect. And so when gravity is lower, okay, your walking speed also just kind of very naturally takes a hit. And so if you were to exert kind of the same energy as you're walking now on the moon, you would just walk a lot slower because so gravity is a lot less. Uh, any questions on uh, any questions on this? All right. So, last thing I want to talk about today is um, I talk about gate uh, transition. So I don't think we're going to get to running today, but at the very least, we can talk about the transition to running. Okay. So, so far, you know, up until this point, you know, we've, we've kind of assumed kind of that, we, that we're walking at kind of constant speed, okay? Um, and so, you know, there, there are times, you know, um, throughout the day when you're walking, you either need to increase your speed or decrease. If you're in a hurry, and you have to get something, okay? And so to increase your, your walking speed, usually what you do is that you, you increase your cadence, so you increase the frequency of your steps, you just take steps faster, right? And so when this happens, you know, the, the typical the typical kind of uh, ratio of the stance phase, the swing phase, of course, is going to change, right? And so as you kind of take steps faster, what that does is that it, it shortens the length of the stance phase.
And then naturally, if the stance phase is shortened, that means the double support phase is going to be shortened as well. Okay, so the amount of time where both of your feet are on the ground when you're walking, um, that's going to be shorter. So we can uh, we can plot this. Okay. So these plots are, are going to be a little bit different, and so um, you know I'm going to show the the ground reacting forces from actually two from both feet at the same time. Okay. And, and so just like our other graphs, our, our horizontal axis here is going to be time, our vertical axis is going to be force. Okay. And so if we were to kind of draw out, so let's say that we're stepping with our left leg first. Uh, so normal walking, you know, might look something like like this. So, you know, you have your your left leg in purple, and then you have your right leg here. I'm going to use. And so this area where they kind of overlap each other and they're both non-zero, this is the phase of double support. Right? And so in double support, both of your feet are on the ground. And so you register kind of a vertical reaction force from, uh, from both planes of the same. Right? As you increase your speed, and so like, you know, as you start to speed walk, you know, it starts to look something like this. So once again, we're going to have the left leg here, okay, but we're going to have just, it's going to be shortened. And then we have the right leg. This is a little bit exaggerated. Normally, you don't shorten it this much, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. But I, but I wanted to kind of emphasize the fact that you know, as, as you kind of pick up your pace, that double support phase is, is going to, um, it's going to shorten. Okay. okay. And so when you look at these graphs, right? So remember, remember one thing I mentioned on Monday is that running, running, when running occurs, you no longer have a double support phase. You have what's called a flight phase instead. Okay. And so a flight phase is when neither of your feet are on the ground. And so intuitively speaking, you know, I think when people when, when people are first kind of introduced to this idea of, of transition, people think of, of gait transition as this kind of smooth thing. And you can kind of slowly increase your cadence until the point where you're where you're running. Okay. But that's actually not the case. So normally you would think. Because right, that's technically how we define running. So running has no double support; it has a flight phase. Okay. But running, but at, you know, the natural thing that most people do is that they actually start running uh, before this. Okay. And so if I if I were to tell you that you know if you um, I need you to go pick up something from the office and I need you to come back here in two minutes, right? Most people will actually jog, right? Even though it's you know not that far, right? That the natural thing is to kind of jog. And, and it's not like something that you physically can't do, right? And so you can certainly speed walk. You can just kind of walk really, really fast to, to get somewhere, right? But if you've ever speed walked somewhere for a very long period of time, 
you'll know that it's 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 not the most comfortable thing in the world. Your your calves just kind of end up just burning like, like crazy. Okay. And there's a reason for that. And so because of the of the biomechanics of, of walking, and so in terms of kind of the muscles that are involved and kind of the motion of the body, it's actually not very energy efficient to just keep walking. And in fact, you know, everyone has kind of a, a, a comfortable speed at which they walk and which they run that kind of um, minimizes the amount of energy required. And if there's one thing that your body is, and so and so, and this is true for every human body, is that you, your body wants to be as energy efficient as possible. Right? If you can complete a task, you know, by expending the least amount of energy, that's that's usually the most desirable thing to, to do, right? unless you're purposely trying to to burn calories. All right. And so what you'll see is that you know if you if you are kind of hurrying someone and you try to ask them to kind of get from point A to point B in a very quick manner, right? Uh, and maybe they can achieve that with, uh, with you know, a speed walking speed at a constant speed. What you'll see people do is that you'll see people jog for a little bit, then they'll walk for a little bit, then they'll jog for a little bit, then they'll walk. Okay. And the reason for that is because jogging, then walking, jogging, then walking is actually a lot more energy efficient than just speed walking at a constant speed. Okay. And so for, for most people, the efficient walking speed It's somewhere around 1.5 meters per second. And the running speed, which is kind of more of a jog, is around 4.0 meters per second, okay, approximately. Of course, you know, it depends on the person, depends on, on their legs, but that's about average uh, for the human body. And of course, you know, it is possible to, to uh, you know, to walk at speeds in between this, but, you know, let's say that you, you need to get to a parking structure kind of on the other side of campus, and the average speed that you need is about 2.5 millimeters per second, okay? You're going to do that through a combination of walking and, and jogging as opposed to either, you know, running the whole way or, or speed walking. Okay. So this, so this, so this is another thing that's going to come up, you know, uh, more uh, later, uh, later in the class about kind of energy efficiency, kind of what's the best, um, most energy efficient way to, to do the task. And the fascinating thing is that your body does this automatically. So you don't even have to think about it. So you don't even have to know the data. Your body just kind of knows what's, uh, what to do. All right, any, uh, any final questions on this? Okay, all right, so that's all we got to, uh, planned for today. Oh, I do have uh, one announcement. And so uh, Monday, I'm planning to be sick. Uh, I'm gonna I'm coming I'm gonna come down with the condition of gas is way too fucking expensive and I hate driving here. So uh, the lecture on Monday will be virtual. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna be at home on Monday. So I'm gonna be on Zoom. Okay, I'll, I'll send an announcement over Zoom to. Uh, okay, so I hope you guys have a good weekend, everyone, um, and I'll see you all on Monday. <laughs>
Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. So, it's, it's a little, I just, I guess, is that the be best place to put it is on our ramp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't. Getting the key program. I, just, I don't know. It's like. Uh, so this is fun yeah. for dynamically kind yeah. of do the balance. Yes. Yeah. 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 I don't know the hardware. I think the idea that you have makes make sense is adding skills or parts. I think what's going to be more complicated is kind of dynamic and telling them, yeah, I think the logic for this problem for this project is actually more so than the more so than the yeah, because you because you can you can put sensors, you can put scales on a on a ramp. I don't think I don't think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I just have to kind of adjust the calculations on a ramp to you know take take just that normal component of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, applying <laughs> the logic and doing it in a way that's kind of seen that for the right operators, I think that's that's going to be the challenge. Yeah. Project. So like I would be able to find their weight okay. just from the pressure in their feet. Oh, yeah. right? Because like it was, I was starting to second guess it. Like, what if they are like leaning over, like but then I was like, but all of their weight is still in their foot, so yeah. like, I wouldn't be able to. But then I was like, how am I going to do this in real time? Because like what I was thinking was that like it would have to be a very powerful computer. Yes. And then like yeah. I was thinking like okay, every every tenth of a second is a lot, but like it would be able to like. Track, I don't know, and then differentiating. I think, like, because you know, when because people kind of overlap too, yeah, really. and so that's yeah. that's going to be the hard thing, too. So, I think maybe maybe you have like a um, the I mean, ideally, I think you would have like a sensor that can yeah. kind of sense the size of the foot, too, yeah, that's what I was thinking, or with, or with, with the weight, too. But then that that yeah. also yeah. can be not super reliable, so yeah, maybe you had another sensor for like, yeah, I don't know, can, like a camera on the outside, too, but yeah, yeah, that would, yeah, I think that would be. Yeah. That would be another it like it be yeah, I mean, in, terms of, in terms of the weight, uh, yeah, you can you can absolutely get that even from just like a simple like digital scale. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that just fine. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of differentiating it, or maybe you do something in terms of like crowd control. Mm -hmm. Maybe like because there, remember, there's certain parts like when you're queuing for a ride, like where you kind of have to go kind of one by one. Mm -hmm. Maybe you put the sensor there so that you kind of know that it's like not multiple people walking on together at the same time. So yeah, yeah. So there's there's I think yeah it's, 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 a lot of interesting things, but just simply and logically. Yeah. Uh, but the scale, I think, should be no okay. You can put any kind of pressure sensor. So. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to be perfectly exact, too. Because right? you're not you're not getting the exact weight, and you're not getting everything down to like one pound. Right? Yeah. So you're getting an approximate approximate weight. Just just it's just for load balance, basically. Yeah. And so it doesn't have to be super yeah. precise in terms of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, how are you going to do the model? Uh, control and the sensing and stuff. That's, that's, that's more yeah. The way I can see it, like in my brain, is like you get like a matrix of like pressure sensors, and the computer watches the beat as it moves to know like that. But then, I, but then I, it was like, but there's going to be lots of people. I don't know, but because we have to make our low fidelity prototypes. Yeah. So I need to I need to come up with like an enough. Oh, that's good. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll give both of them just in here. Yeah. That's, that's, that's easier to get on. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, Something that can be used in both of those. Yeah. Something like MATLAB or something. Just to kind of show how the logic works. Yeah. Yeah, it does happen. It's always the same. It's just important that same logic, just with the real sensors and things like that. Yeah. And then for like, because when I was like doing some research, I found some like, um, there was some like lab that sensed or like had pressure sensors in people's shoes mm -hmm. to see where like people's like weight is placed. So I was just thinking like, if it is like a matrix of like um, 
pressure sensors, like, would it just be like the average of all of like my points? Like if mm. there's. Yeah. Hmm. I'm also not great at coding, so that's 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 no. also stressing me out. But I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. Right now. Fancy it's not. No, it's not. No fidelity. Yeah, no fidelity. So, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a tough one. That's uh, that's challenging to do it in a way. I think, like, I think if you perfectly control, it's this one of those things where it's like it seems like an easy problem because if you perfectly control for it, mm -hmm. like, yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. we're giving Q to what's on weight, mm -hmm. but accounting for just so many of the different factors that you have and just the chaos that is like at Disneyland. It's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. To get all to get everything, get all the cases that are working. Is That's the biggest thing. Yeah. There's so many cases that can happen. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. you can never be prepared for all right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was cool though. That sounds yeah. like a really fun subject. Yeah. yeah. It's the thing we were going over it. I was like, I was yeah. like, oh my god, this is a perfect time <laughs> to ask about this. So yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know exactly. Like, I know the force and the force place that, that typically are used against the state of our own. It'll be there. Um. And so, but but this was a wild thing. So I don't know. If they I don't know if they come up with better uh, with cheaper ones. And so you can look into it. I, I haven't uh, I haven't looked into it in a while. But if you look at force plates, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and stuff. stuff uh, like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was pretty much it. Yeah. Pretty much it. Just, yeah. No, if you, if you if you want more feedback, just let me know too. I'm, I'm interested. I would so. love your feedback. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> we're kind of we're kind of yeah. We're we're we're. It's a work in progress. Right? Yeah. Ah, I mean, a rough work in progress. I mean that's that's senior design, right? It's it's, yeah. a, it's a work in progress the whole time, and then you never really feel hundred percent on it because you know there's deadlines and stuff like that. But, yeah. But it's 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 a learning process. That's what it's all about. Yeah. You guys will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're gonna slay. We're gonna, You're gonna kill it. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the word I'm used to. Kill it. Kill it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all the same the thing. thing. They're, they're just trying to teach me to say slay. Uh, right. yeah. yeah. We kill slay. It's, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for this. Yeah, thing of course. And giving your input. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Quick question. Sure. I wish you would have said you're going on Zoom on Wednesday. Yeah. Because I would have made, I would have saw my answer. Uh -huh. But I have to travel for work. Oh, okay. Week. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday I'll be out. Okay. But uh, my my I land on the East Coast like around three that time. Yeah. So I'm hoping that I can join. Okay. On Zoom, but is there anything I'm gonna miss from that day? Ah, uh, nothing. Or any announcements I might miss? I'll I'll any yeah. big announcements I'll put in I'll put in an email. Okay. Um, and so you, you just have to watch the recording to like your after. So. All right, cool. Just making sure. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can switch it to Monday. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, leave. Bye. Yeah. That's okay. Um, I got a few questions. Sure. So Absolutely. we're in four forty one and fifty four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's final projects for both classes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there is a graduate project for both. Yes. Classes. It's it's more like a paper review, right? So for this one, it's a paper review. Okay. Um. And so actually, so actually, you remind me. Someone actually sent me the papers. Like I need to review. Um. Oh, people are coming. No, no, no. They're oh. they're just they're just sending me their papers. Just you need to do it. First. Oh, okay. It's something like that. Okay. So for this class, it, it doesn't take that long. So I I just want you to find a paper. Probably something related to your final project and do kind of an mm -hmm. independent kind of review mm -hmm. kind of report before okay. the application. For the optimization class, I, I hadn't thought about it until earlier this week, but I think, but but I'm I'm kind of forming the final project in my head right now. Okay. What I think I'm gonna have you guys do is kind of an extra, an extra component to the final project. Okay. Um, and so what the final project is gonna consist of is I'm basically gonna give you um, one really tough optimization problem. And I want you to write the code for it, but I'm going to give everyone kind of a, a test problem to kind of test their algorithm. Okay. And so I think what I'll probably do for you guys is I'll probably give you an additional problem that's, to in, add it on to that's it. in between those two. So in between the hard one and in between the easy one. Okay. okay. So, you, and so just, you just kind of apply your code to that, mm -hmm. uh, to that extra problem. Okay. That's that's what I'm thinking right now. But it might change a little so bit. So we're going to develop code for both the problems that's exactly. going to be the task. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Because I, I, I know, um, I mean, it's already kind of a lot of work. Yeah, I, I assign a lot of work for my clients. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I never want the grad, I didn't, I never imagined the graduate project to be something that much more severe. Like Because mm -hmm. yeah. I've taught 500 level classes and the amount of work that I give for both is it's, not that it's kind of easy. It's and, almost that. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So, and so, you know, the graduate project is not going to be that much. Okay. That much. Is that, so for 454, is that going to be a group project or is that going to be no. individual? Yeah, okay. so, so for biomechanics, this one's going to be a group project. Okay. Gonna, there's a final presentation component. Got it. Um, and we don't have time for everyone to do a presentation. But for 454, it's going to be individual. individual. Okay. So it's going to be like a 
very big assignment. Yes. Rather than a project and presentation. You can take it like and then yeah. so because it won't have a presentation. You can't have a presentation for a code, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But there is there is gonna be a report a report. Report, yeah. yeah. So I want you to describe the, the outcome. Um, so that, that's kind of how I differentiate because you know what because I'm I'm basically giving everyone the same problem. Yeah. And so everyone's codes are gonna look very similar. Yeah. So, and so the way that you know I find out if someone just copy was you have to explain it. And so usually usually if you wrote your own code, you can kind of explain oh, it. what's going on. Yeah, like what's going on. Yeah. So then for 441, you want to see the paper that we are going to be reviewing beforehand before yes. we start? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then do you like care where we get it from? Like I can go into Google Scholar and just find oh, yeah. like a if it's, paper on if it's 22. Off, and, yeah, if it's off Google Scholar, then any, anything there is and fine. Does it have to be like peer reviewed or anything of the sort? Or do you um, just ideally, yes. Okay. Um, but I've 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 let people do other papers too. Okay. So that's, that's why I have you send it to me first. Okay. So I can, I can look it up. And we can choose any topic as long as it falls under biomechanics. Yes. Yeah. Got it. And how about the final project for this course? How do you want it to be a design? So we'll design? no. So so the for this course, it's kind of almost like I always tell people it's almost like you're kind of preparing a lesson. Um, and so you know, um, kind of the flavor of kind of how I design this class is oh, it's yeah. kind of very broad. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we're talking about kind of very broad topics, but I think people have kind of very specific interests in biomechanics, mm -hmm. like yeah. aesthetics, or like you know, soccer, or like you know something yeah, exactly. like that. And so what I tell people is like think of it as if you're like kind of like preparing almost like a short lesson on that. Oh, like applying a very we, specific topic, yeah. Yeah, applying what we've learned in the class to that topic. And so you're gonna do calculations, so you're gonna do like example problems, mm -hmm. um, and then show it in your presentation and show it in your report as well. So that's going from macro to micro. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much for no the so, also, you said midterm grades are supposed to be up tonight? Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to power through. I have like eight more to go. So, I'm just going to power through. Oh, what's the average looking like? Oh, it's pretty high. It's like 80 in the 80s. All right, I'll take it. Hopefully, I'm not below that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, have a good one, Professor. You too. See you guys. Yeah. Oh, any, any final questions before I wrap it up? <laughs>